you have your Bibles, I want us to go to Matthew chapter 25 this morning. And I've a man with a mandate this morning from the Lord. It's been in my heart all week long. And I want to share with you some things as it relates to a passage of Scripture that if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard this passage. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25 is simply the parable of the ten virgins. And in this parable, you want to turn this one off because I have a hard time figuring No, there it is. Yeah, it's the one back there that says light blue. You labeled it, my friend. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> <laughs> I like picking with these guys back there. They're always great fun, and uh, they probably do things later on to embarrass me, <clears throat> and that's all right. Well, we're going to have to lock him out of the computer. <clears throat> um, but this morning, I want you to understand that as we go into God's Word, that if anyone has a spiritual ear to hear today, they will hear that there's a cry um, for our country, but in the church. And it's this song just simply said, and it's, yesterday was the first time I ever sang this song, and this is a song that's just really gripped my heart. My wife got up this morning, she goes, are you still listening to that song i've been listening to it for three days um but it just simply says there's a midnight cry the play button's a little triangle that's facing the sun <clears throat> they're good sports back there the sound of a mighty rushing wind, oh, and it's closer now than it's ever been, I can almost hear the trumpet. At the midnight cry, we'll be going home when Jesus steps out on the cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air and then those that remain shall be quickly changed changed in a moment at the midnight cry, the bride of Christ will rise. Oh, I look around me, I see prophecies they're fulfilling every day. And the signs of the times, they're appearing everywhere. I can almost hear the Father say, son, go and get my children. the midnight cry oh at the 
they will be quickly changed, changed in a moment, and the midnight cry, oh, and the midnight cry, oh, and the midnight cry, the bride will be going like that make me feel like I'm going to pass out. <laughs> Matthew chapter 25 beginning in verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto. Now, anytime you hear the scripture and it says, then the kingdom of heaven is likened unto something, that means pay attention. It means what Jesus is about to say has kingdom implication. So in other words, this morning I'm asking you Get your antennas up and pay real close attention to what I'm going to share. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed... They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you, but rather... You go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore. For you, know, you do not know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. Father, would you add your blessing and anointing to your word today? May it be delivered as the mandate you've burdened my heart with today. Quicken us and change us as a church. Not just here, but across this country. Give preachers ears to hear what you're speaking instead of what the people desire to hear. Strengthen us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. We live in a day and time where a lot of people, I'm going to loosen this up because now my neck is really tight. Is that all right? Too late. But we live in a day and time where everybody wants something without paying a price. I'm going to make a statement. It may make you upset. You may not like it, but I'll say it anyway. God does not have a welfare system. Everything we have in the kingdom is because it costs a very high price. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It cost heaven its greatest prize in Jesus Christ. So it was not free, but it definitely was not cheap. And we're living in a day where people want, but they don't want to pay a price. I've heard people in other churches say, well, I just don't get much out of my church and my answer to them is you want more out of the church, put more into the church. Invest yourself, worship, get connected in those kind of things. Instead of putting the onus on somebody else, you invest yourself. Now, if that, uh, that will not apply to you, but if it does apply, you know, put it in your billfold and, 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 and let it marinate. But the more you invest, the more you get as a return. But in the kingdom of God today, the Bible says the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to, but then it says, but afterwards, remember in the beginning of the scripture it says afterward. 
Okay, the kingdom is going to be likened after what? After what was he talking about? When? Well, you've got to go back to chapter 24 to see that. We oftentimes read the Scripture in its compartments. and But when Scripture was written, it was not breaking, broken into chapters until scholars decided to divide it in such a way, rightly dividing it, so we would understand subject matter. But the Scripture, if you understand, if you go all the way back in chapter 24, which is not really a whole long distance back, it's one chapter, Jesus is predicting the signs of the coming of the end. He is telling them some things to be wary of and be careful of as the days wind down. One of the things that he tells them is that, you know, in his coming, if it's delayed, don't be deceived by false prophets. He tells them to hold on to their faith, and then he says in chapter 25, then the kingdom of heaven. Well, when is the kingdom of heaven like these virgins? When you're getting close to the last days. Now, I understand. I heard it preached, spit, and screamed when I was a kid that Jesus is coming back. Guys, he is coming back. You're just closer today than you were a decade ago. But here we have a very dangerous picture. The Bible says you have ten virgins, but they break it. It's, the, it's very specific. You have five that are wise and five that are foolish. They're all virgins, are they not? They are all dressed the same. They are all covered the same. They all had the same type of lamp. They all had wicks in their lamp, and they all had an initial touch of fire on their lamp. But the Bible distinctly breaks them up into two categories, wise and foolish. Can I say it like this? Wise and lazy. Now, any time in Scripture, I always tell you, pay attention to numbers, because whenever you see the number five in Scripture, it is significant because it's talking about, it's a number of grace. When God gave the, 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 the guidelines for the making of the tabernacle and the temple, it was five cubits here, five cubits there, five cubits Why? Because everything in the kingdom is based around or built upon the grace of God. When Jesus fed the multitudes, he had two fish and five loaves to feed them. He had the, 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 the two fish represented the first man, Adam, and the last man, Jesus. The two represents Christ, but the five represented the grace. I'm not going to go into all that, but I'm just telling you that the number five is significant because it denotes the grace of God in our life. So here we have two groups that have the purity clothing on. They have their lamps. They have grace but in the middle of it, there is one deadly difference between the two groups that I believe is in the church. One is wise and productive, while the other is spiritually lazy, wanting everyone to give to them spiritual things without paying spiritual prices. We live in a day and time, it is, let me have your jacket for a second. We live in a day and time where we would much rather, and stand right here, much rather go to services, and I'm not making fun here, I'm just showing you in a comical way what we run to. We want to go to services that are highly advertised and have people throw jackets on us and sling water on us and all this kind of stuff and, and dunk us in, in bathtubs full of oil or slap us in the face or hit us real hard on the head. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we just, we're in that day where somebody advertises a spiritual service and we're like, oh, I got to go there. I got to go get the importation. And what we're wanting is God to give us something through someone that we didn't pay a price for. There is no substitution for paying the price spiritually. And we have to understand that we got to pay a price spiritually in order to be the church that God has called us to be. It is not enough to have the garments. It is not enough to have the lamp. It is not enough to have a wick or even the initial touch of fire on the church. There has got to be a distinct difference, and that is that we have oil when times are getting dark outside. This is a picture of the church. They have grace, but only half of them did what was necessary. But all of them fell asleep 
in the delaying of the bridegroom coming. We live in a day, guys, ladies and gentlemen, where you can live any way you want to and expect greasy grace to slip you into the kingdom of heaven. No, I'm sorry. You can't live any way you want to. You have to live according to God's word, which is God's word is his grace to empower us for change so that we can live godly and be a light in this life. But everybody wants people to give them things in the kingdom. They don't want to pay a price. You cannot walk in an anointing of the Holy Spirit without paying a price. You cannot walk in this life and be spiritually empowered. Look, we run from prayer services. I don't have time for that. Fasting? Nah. Read the Bible in the year? Too busy for it. It's a picture of the church, five wise, five foolish. Both had the grace of God to keep and maintain change, but the mind got in the way. The Apostle Paul admonishes the Corinthian church, and he says, take every thought into captivity and make it subject to Jesus Christ. But he gives it a, goes a little further. He says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Can I look right up here? Can I tell you, spiritual laziness is against the knowledge of Christ. I said something one day at this last month. I don't know when it was. So if it's repetitive for you, it's, it's okay. Statistics show that we need to hear things more than once even to retain it. So that's all right. We will go to Bush Gardens with a migraine headache and get on the Loch Ness Monster and be flipped all over the place. Now, you guys know me. I, I, I'm... I, I don't pull any punches on God's word. So we'll go there. We'll do all that kind of stuff, laugh, carry on, but the same headache will keep us out of church, away from a prayer service. We'll go, we'll go, I don't know what that place is at Bush Gardens. It's a barbecue place. It's got them big old turkey legs. Now, love the pastor this morning. I know this is difficult, but listen, we will go to a theme park and spend $100, $150, $200 on food for our family and friends. And then when it comes to the biblical aspect of tithing, we run from it or justify why we don't do it. We will come and want everybody to bathe us in prayer, and we haven't bent our knee one time. And what has happened is the enemy is doing exactly what Jesus warned the church was going to happen. He's singing to us a lullaby to get us to go to sleep and stay asleep and be lazy. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, he says, I solemn, this is New Living Translation, he says, I solemnly urge you, that's a, that's a big way of saying this, hey, pay attention, <laughs> you know. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ who will solemnly judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. That's good. Be prepared whether it's favorable to you or not. One translation says be instant in season and out of season. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage people with good teaching. Listen to verse 3. For a time is coming. When people will no longer listen to sound doctrine or wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and run fastly after myth. Listen, the crazier it is today, more people run to it. Listen, I'm not saying God can't do uh, anything. God can do anything, but he doesn't always do everything. Does that make sense? But but we're living in a day, folks, listen, the generation before me paved the way in prayer. They weren't afraid to hit their knee. They weren't afraid to pray out in the middle of the night. They weren't afraid to push away from the table and fast. They weren't afraid to 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 run after God in worship. They weren't afraid of those things. And because of that, my generation came and was touched by God. But now we're living in a day where our young people aren't experiencing God like we want them to be. And the reason is, is that could or could it be 
that the lazy side of Christianity has taken hold of the church and we found ourselves looking to another place saying, will you give me your oil? I, I didn't prepare. I wasn't ready. And, and I didn't take time to pay attention to my vessel. It's interesting that Jesus says that they had oil in their vessel. He never said he had an extra compartment. They had oil in their vessel. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul, when, when the Lord speaks to Ananias the prophet and he tells him to go find Saul at the time, he says, when you find him, I, here's the reason. You've got to pray for him because I've selected him and chosen him as a vessel. You and I are to be a vessel where the anointing and the oil of the Holy Spirit can flow to through a, to a world that is hurting and dying. We're the ones that are supposed to have hope in our lips and healing in our hands, and out of us is supposed to flow a stream that brings healing, not confusion and chaos, but healing to our community. God has given us the power of His Spirit that we might do that, but laziness pushes away from the table of the Spirit and gets us entangled with the devices of the flesh, and we get the give-me attitude. It's good to see young Master Benton in the service with us this morning, Nick and Rebecca's newborn little man. But there's going to be a day when one of his first words is, Mine! And they're going to grieve him in his spirit. Tick him off when you take his to mine. I can tell you how to fix, fix that. Let me take a sip of water on that one. The flesh is selfish. Flesh wants everything but desires to pay nothing for it. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about our lives. We will, we will come to an altar and pray 3.25 minutes. And if something doesn't happen, we leave frustrated and irritated. I remember a day I could remember my grandmother telling me and other saints like Granny Bloomer and Mary Gwaltney and other ones that have gone on be, to be with the Lord. I can remember them telling me of a secret of a little thing called praying through. Where people would pray until they got a hold of God and there wasn't a time limit or a time frame. They wanted God more than they wanted anything else. Now we're inundated with iPads, iPods, i stuff isn't it as amazing that it's and i've got them i got an ipad up here i've got an iphone don't judge me but uh <laughs> for those watching on youtube don't judge me i've got the i product but 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 listen to me isn't it interesting that they marketed it with the i in front of it It's one of the fastest selling things. Listen, it, con it, it convinced our community and our school board to spend $1.5 million to, to buy iPads for all of our high school students. They got them with them today. You know, they, it's a great thing. But listen, iPad, iPhone, I, my pad, my phone, mine. Give me mine. Take the iPad away from one of them. Watch their face. It'll contort. They'll get all powdered up because you took their thing. Listen, we ought to be powdered up because somewhere along the way we would put our guard down and allowed the enemy to come in and steal the very essence of who we were supposed to be and what we were supposed to have was the oil of the Holy Spirit to bring healing to a community, not the, not the effort, uh, the, 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 the aroma of confusion that nobody understood. But we were supposed to have oil that would bring healing, but instead we got focused on ourselves, wanted the quick way out, and now most churches have about enough power to get the vacuum cleaner turned on. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy in the chapter 3 towards the beginning, he said, know this, in the last days perilous times will come. He goes through a list of stuff, and actually Paul is an overseer talking to a pastor about the church. He said, in the last days, here's what's going to happen. People are going to be lovers of them. The first thing he says, they're going to be lovers of themselves. Mine! 
Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Mm -hmm. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I don't want to do this, but I can do this. I will miss I know this is right up in our face this morning. I will miss church, but I won't miss the roller coaster. I will miss this, but I won't miss my job. I will miss that, but if I have a need, I'll be the first one to grab a whole bunch of people to pray for me. Listen to me. There's an inversion of healthy spirituality that's taking place in the church. We in America, look, look, I... I We've got Christian gimmicks like crazy. Come to this portal, come to this area, come and get your blessing on. You know, and I'm watching some of the latest stuff in Christian advertising. There's now another wave of prayer cloth stuff. Listen, if you want a prayer cloth, I'm serious. I, we'll go buy the stuff, we'll anoint, we'll pray, because that's not, I don't have a problem with the prayer cloth. But I do have the problem of worshiping it. And I do have the problem of that making that the object of our desire. And I do have a problem with preachers saying, you want to activate the power of it, send your $1,000 vow of faith. Are you kidding me? And everybody's trying to get a hold of something for nothing. You say, well, pastor, that's $1,000 or something. Yeah, that's a fraud. Listen to what he says. They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power. That, listen, one translation says, they'll deny the power they profess, change them. Five wise, five foolish. Both had grace, but one had no power. One group had oil in their vessel. The other one didn't have what it took, and night was coming at a rapid pace. And when they were awakened, listen, I believe there's a call going out to the church, and it's simply this, wake up. Those that have received grace from God, wake up. And that's what, that's what happened to these ten virgins. A call came and said, wake up. And they all got up, but there was a problem. Wisdom had paid the price, but laziness made excuses. Laziness looked to other people. Laziness ended up costing them. He said, from such people turn away. For these are the sort of those that creep into households and make captive gullible women loaded with sin, led away by various lusts. In Paul's day, well, even in today's time, you have a bunch of some so-called preachers out there. A lot of them aren't even on TV, but, but I hear reports of it all the time. Pastors and ministers going and taking advantage of vulnerable women that have found themselves uh, in, in distress. and do, It's no different than when it was in Paul's day. It is no different. History repeats itself. The kingdom, uh, the kingdom is on a cycle. And we see those things taking place. Listen to this. They're led away by various us, always learning. <clears throat> oh, that was a great nugget today, Pastor. Woo! Always learning. But never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You say, what does that mean? I'm learning it, but it's never become life application. It's never applied in my life. So I hear it and I celebrate. I say, whoa. Good work, Pastor. Woo! Stepped on my toes, but I made no notable change. Always learning, but never coming. He said, as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so these resist the truth. People of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. They will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs was also. Not too long ago, I read a story about a mainstream preacher in the United States. They brought in a, an Old Testament type scroll. They sat him on a throne. They put a kingdom, a king's hat on his head. They paraded him around the sanctuary. They proclaimed all these Hebrew blessings over him, which I think are wonderful. But they did all of those things, and on the heels of it found out he was messing with young boys. Now, 
I have a problem, especially when you're pastoring one of the largest churches in America. What's happened to us? We used to be a place that had oil. See, here's the three things that oil provides. Number one, it provides the fuel necessary to keep a fire alive. It's first. Secondly, oil has a unique ability to soothe devastating wounds when you've been cut or wounded. In the, in the scriptural days, now we have all kind of stuff in hospitals and morphine and the stuff that makes you forget your name and all this kind of stuff. But in biblical days, if you got a great wound, if a horse kicked you in the face, okay, they would break out the oil and they would pour it on you because the oil had an ability to soothe the pain away. Thirdly, the oil had the ability to grab a hold of the dirt that was inside the wound and upon the body and carry it off. The oil of the Holy Spirit is no different. It gives us what we need to stay on fire. He gives us what we need to be healed in the sense that the pain of this life is carried away, but at the same time, he produces the power for us to stay clean. There were five wise and there were five foolish. And the kingdom of heaven is likened unto these. Grace on their doors. Wisdom in one. Laziness in the other. But I want you to understand something. There was a common denominator in them. They all fell asleep. Because the Bible says that his coming was delayed. When I was a kid sitting in church, I would see preachers turn red-faced and scream like sometimes you see me get excitable. They'd spit all over the place, run all over the platform, be out of breath, and they'd be telling you, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming. And everybody would get all fired up. And then we noticed that over time, the words, the Lord is coming soon, has very little effect on the hearers. They all fell asleep. But when they woke up, only one had a reserve to go to. There have been men and women that have paved the way through pain and tears and prayer and fasting and sacrifice so that we would be able to stand in the place that we're standing today in the kingdom of God. And my question is, are we going to do the same? Or are we just going to let the same cycles repeat in us? Listen, an excuse doesn't have to be a lie to be an excuse. Did you know that? It can actually be a true thing going on in your life, but nonetheless used as an excuse. If one thing I found, this pain in my body, it, it's starting to really, 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 really. The only times that I'm pain-free now is when I'm standing behind this pulpit and ministering. It's the only time my body doesn't have any pain. But I sleep with pain. I wake up with pain. I drive with pain. From the top of my head to the base of my spine, I'm in pain every single day. And if one thing I've seen and known, they laid me in an MRI the other day, and if I'd have been the Incredible Hawk, I'd have ripped that thing apart. <clears throat> they wrapped me up like a burrito and put me in that thing for 90 minutes. 90 minutes I laid there, my back hurting. I kept letting her know. I said, I'm hurting, and I, I, I'm hurting. And she says, I'm sorry, we can't take you out, and you just messed up your first film. I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to mess your whole machine up if you don't get me out of this thing. But I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, a tear began to stream down my face, and I said, God, I'm hurting right here, and I just need your help just for a few minutes. And the presence of the Lord just covered me in that MRI. And I had maybe about a two-minute window where the pain went away, but it gave me what I needed to keep holding on the rest of the way. The pain in your life can do one of two things, either push you to pray or push you to use it as an excuse to run away from the things of God.